Hi, and welcome to NOAA Central Library's educational platform for the presentation of research and ideas in support of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's mission. My name is Lisa, and I am your NOAA Central Library host. Today's library seminar is titled Optimal Spatial Boundaries and Strata for Stock Assessment and Confronting Practical Realities. The presentation is part of the National Stock Assessment Science Seminar Series, which is developed by NOAA Fisheries and organized by Kristen Blackheart. Today's speaker, Steve Cadron, Steve will be introduced by Kristen. Before I hand over the mic, here are a few housekeeping items for your consideration. If you have trouble with the audio or visual components of GoToWebinar, we suggest that you log out and rejoin us. This resets the software and usually resolves most technical issues. Our presentation is being recorded and will be available on the NOAA Central Library YouTube channel later today. I've added the link to the chat, chat box. We are very interested in your questions and we encourage you to ask them throughout the seminar, even though the speaker will not address them until the end of his presentation. All audience members are muted, so type your questions or comments in the chat box under questions located in the control panel of GoToWebinar. To our live audience participants, we encourage you to fill out the quick survey at the end of this webinar because the library wants to learn more about what you'd like to see in the future. So with that last detail, let's get started. The mic is yours, Kristen. Thank you, Lisa. Um, we are so pleased today to have one of our academic partners with us to share some of their research. Steve Cadron is a professor at the University of Massachusetts School for Marine Science and Technology. He is the chair of the Department of Fisheries and Oceanography and has been a stock assessment scientist for over 30 years. So a lot of experience to share with us today. Um, he previously was with the Northeast Fisheries Science Center and Massachusetts Marine Fisheries. His accomplishments include the advancement of stock assessment methods for a wide range of invertebrate and fin fish species, fishery management advice for regional and international fisheries, and global leadership in evaluating geographic stock structure and modeling spatially complex populations which is what he'll be sharing with us today. So I will hand it over to you, Steve. Thanks for being with us. Great, thanks, Chris. And I just confirm that you can hear me. Sounds great. Great. Well, thanks to Lisa for um, organizing the webinar and for Kristen for the invitation. Uh, these uh, seminars have helped me get through the lockdown. So I'm happy to uh, give back a little bit and share my perspectives on spatial boundaries and straight out for a stock assessment. Uh, as Kristen said, I'm a professor at the UMass School of Marine Science and Technology, Department of Fisheries Oceanography. Uh, we're a graduate program uh, with strengths in field work and quantitative, quantitative training. We have a formal partnership with NOAA through the Cooperative Institute for the North Atlantic Region and with the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries, who share our campus in New Bedford, which is the number one economic fishing port in the United States. So today I'll be covering two major topics. Um, one is what I perceive as renewed attention to stock identification. And then as a demonstration of that, um, some recent examples over the last year, and those case studies really illustrate some practical challenges with implementing best uh, practices. Uh, all of these case studies have been collaborations with many scientists that have enjoyed uh, but today I'll just be presenting uh, my perspectives on those. So I'm going to start out with you know, why is spatial structure and stock structure important? Um, and I think Jason Link and his co-authors um, recently tried to answer that question in their 2019 paper. Uh, at least from an ecosystem perspective, they asked what are the most important population processes? And right at the top was movement, migration, or location. And things like overfishing and other processes came in secondary to that. Well, if we ranked how much time and effort we devote to different uh, population processes and stock assessment, I think we'd come up with a list that looks something like this, where we spend a lot of our time and effort to estimate the fishery catch, uh, the landings and discards, uh, beyond that, we try to build in some demographics, either size structure or age structure. We give some attention to things like uh, recruitment, estimating recruitment, either as a 
deviation from a long-term average or from a stock recruit relationship. Uh, we make some assumptions about natural mortality or even we try to estimate it. Um, we do spend a little bit of time on location. What is the stock area that we're assessing um, to compile all of our data? We give very little attention to movement and migration. So almost the opposite um, of the priorities that uh, Jason Link and his co-authors had put forward uh, is the attention that we give to movement, migration, and location. So why is stock structure considered to be important by Jason and others? Um, because in theory, the stock assessment models that we typically apply have three assumptions related to the unit stock, that it's a closed unit, that there's no um, emigration of fish from the stock area to adjacent areas, there's no immigration of fish into the area from other areas. All of the fish in the stock uh, have homogeneous vital rates. They all grow about the same, they mature at the same rate. Um, they have similar natural mortality and the stock is well mixed. So if we remove fish from one portion of the stock area, uh, the mixing will even out the density so that we can monitor the density uh, in areas and hope that it represents the stock. So these three assumptions are valid when the stock boundaries encompass a biological population. And if the patterns within that population uh, are represented by spatial strata within the stock area. So that's in theory. In practice, we really assess a range of different biological units. Uh, there are some that meet those three assumptions. As I said, we might have a species in which the entire species is a single population that can be managed as a stock according to those three assumptions. We may have a discrete population within a species that is also discrete enough uh, that we're assessing the entire population with our models. But on the other end, we have a whole range of different biological units that don't meet those assumptions. Uh, at one range, we have a species complex where we know that these species are reproductively isolated. That's the species concept. Uh, and so they're independent populations that we're modeling together. Uh, very similarly, we can have a species that has multiple populations in it that also have some degree of reproductive isolation that we're treating as one population. Uh, many populations have substructure or subpopulations where there's some reproductive connectivity between them, but there's enough isolation that they have demographic independence. Within that, we can have phenotypic stocks that respond to environmental conditions, and so they may not be genetic populations, but simply because of their environment, they have different growth rates or maturity rates, et cetera. And then finally, at the other extreme, we may have just harvest stocks. Uh, units that are either have different exploitation patterns or respond differently to the same exploitation pattern. So again, we have this wide range of units that we model as stocks. But we've seen through many case studies that there are advantages to accounting for spatial population structure, and that can promote productive fisheries. And there have been several case study studies um, that have gone through and shown the advantages of recognizing and conserving population structure. On the other hand, we've had several management failures where there's been overfishing, depletion, failure to rebuild that have been at least partly due to misleading stock assessments because we ignored population structure. And these range a wide range of fisheries and species from invertebrates to highly migratory species in which these authors have concluded that spatial structure was important for successful assessment and management. And the opposite is true too, that ignoring stock structure has led to some failures. Uh, these types of observations led Carl Walters to conclude that if we look at fisheries that have been successful over the long term, the reason isn't that they have great assessments or great management systems, but he attributed it to a spatial accident. It was something about the spatial structure of the population dynamics interacted well with the regulatory system. So it was this happy accident that we had a fishery success because 
Um, just as a coincidence, the management unit lined up with the population structure. Um, and so many authors have gone back and looked at population structure as a reason for success or failure of assessment and management. But of course, all of those case studies had multiple factors that were leading to that success or to that failure. So that brings in the role of simulation. Through simulation, we can actually isolate the different population processes that we're interested in. And all of these authors um, have done spatial simulation estimation studies in which they condition their simulations on a spatially complex uh, species and fishery. Again, another wide range of species from invertebrates to large uh, pelagics. Um, and with the spatial model, they can simulate data, the data that's typical for stock assessment. They can apply conventional um, stock assessments that have no spatial structure, or maybe the management unit is not well aligned with the population unit. And they can compare the truth from the operating model uh, to the estimates from the simpler stock assessments to make the same conclusions, that when we account for spatial structure and assessments, it can improve the performance. And conversely, when we ignore spatial structure, it can lead to misperceptions of stock status. And so this really puts a lot of importance onto um, the identification of stocks and structure within stocks. Fortunately, the field of stock identification has advanced really leaps over the last uh, few decades with advancements in genetics and electronic tagging and oil of chemistry and microstructure, um, spatial analyses. And so what's really evolved is a best practice towards interdisciplinary stock identification in which we consider the new information and we reconcile that with the traditional information. Uh, a great example of this is genomics. Genomics has advanced very quickly to be extremely powerful to you know, now having um, hundreds or thousands of genetic characters that we can analyze along with their linkage, along with their um, susceptibility to selection or neutrality. That gives us a lot of information that we never had uh, traditionally. However, genetics in themselves don't give us the entire picture. We really need to overlay the information from genetics with the distributional information, the dispersal patterns at both the early life history stages and the later life history stages. Geographic variation, not just in genetics for reproductive isolation, but also in demographics and phenotypic uh, attributes. So that we can come up with a holistic view of the paradigm of population structure. Once we found this structure, we can identify the features that are most discriminating so we can apply things like stock composition analysis. We can really define the delineation between stocks uh, based on those most discriminating features. But really, we need to take a step back and take a look at all the information available to us to determine what the most um, probable stock structure is. Once we've identified stocks and structure within stocks, there's a range of different ways that we can represent that in stock assessments. Right at the top, we have the definition of stock boundaries. As I said, based on theory, ideally that the stock boundary is reflecting the, pop, the geographic population boundary as well. So we, starting with the stock boundary is probably most important for meeting those stock assessment model assumptions. If we have some geographic variation within that stock boundary, we can account for that in a number of ways. First of all, it's just compiling the data according to these strata. If we have different regions with different growth rates, then we wanted to compile the size and age composition differently for those two regions. Uh, we typically stratify our indices, either if it's a fishery independent survey, it's stratified by area, or if it's a fishery dependent um, catch rate, it's standardized by area. Going beyond that, we can define fleets spatially, and this is becoming more and more common, where we have fleet structure within the stock assessment, and those fleets reflect those different areas, potentially with different fishing patterns. Going a step further, we can um, structure the population model so it has some area structure. We can allow for movement of fish um, within those, um, between those areas, and we can allow for those movement rates to vary over time and across ages. 
So we go from a fairly conventional model at the top to a more complex and what is a more developmental approach to stock assessment at the bottom. Uh, the tools for doing this have been developed for decades. Uh, Perry Quinn and Rick DeRiso's book in 99, uh, unfortunately both of them just recently passed away in the last couple of years, but they left us the tools to do this. Um, and so we have the technology and the model structure and the methods to do this, but it's been, it's still considered a developmental aspect of stock assessment. Uh, there have been several recent reviews. Uh, Aaron Berger, Dan Gaithel, and, and Pat Lynch um, had convened their spatial, space oddity um, session and special issue, and they concluded that there's really limited examples where there are spatial assessments at least those that are used for the basis of management. So despite all of the spatial data we have, the spatial models we have, they're still somewhat de developmental and rarely applied for management advice. Uh, Andre Klunt had done a review um, about the same time, included the same thing and attributed this slow application to the model complexity, the requirements of the data, uh, that they have important policy implications and simply inertia. When we had uh, one of the CAPM workshops on spatial assessments, we concluded that we really need to get the other population processes well specified first, things like natural mortality, growth, selectivity, before we can really engage in spatial assessments, because if any of those are misspecified, they'll often be confounded with estimates. Uh, movement will be estimate confounded with recruitment or mortality. We can also flip that is that if we have really strong spatial structure, it can also really mess up and confound our attempts to approximate natural mortality, growth, or selectivity. If we go forward to the next CAPM workshop, which is on the next generation assessments, uh, that workshop concluded that the most important feature for the next gen models is that they have the ability for spatial structure. They need to be able to assess stocks that don't satisfy that well-mixed single stock paradigm. And after that architecture is built into the next-gen assessments, then we can also do all the other things that we want to do with the next-gen. But because this really is a structural need within the models, uh, this group of authors, uh, Punt et al., had uh, identified that as the primary need for the next generation of stock assessment models. I think looking more practically, when we look around our stock assessment processes, we see the emergence of stock identification workshops, is that they're now being inserted as a routine aspect in the stock assessment process. Uh, ICES has been doing this for a while, since the 90s. They've had methods working groups. They have um, stock-specific workshops. There was a, an important one on Redfish, uh, 2009, I'll talk about a little later um, a workshop we had last summer on North Sea Cod so that they can do these interdisciplinary stock identifications and uh, try to reflect those in their next benchmark stock assessments. Uh, the Tuna Commissions, ICAT and IATTC have also had species specific workshops and tried to reflect the results from those workshops into their stock assessments. Uh, CDAR has done a great job of inserting a stock assessment workshop, stock, stock identification workshop, where they used to have a data workshop and a model workshop. They now start the process with a stock identification workshop. And that's been happening for a while since the Blue Line Tilefish and CDAR 50 2016. Um, we're currently doing one for Red Snapper. In fact, we have a meeting tomorrow on the Red Snapper um, stock identification uh, workshop for CDAR. In the Northeast, um, this is being implemented through the research track uh, process. Um, I'll talk about the Atlantic Cod Stock Structure Working Group, uh, the Red Hake Stock Structure Working Group. So my real point is here is that I, I see this reemergence of stock identification and the desire to incorporate it in stock assessment. Um, I think it's happening in the literature. Um, I think there's been a lot of justification for it, and I think it's being implemented in practice as well. So with a quick time check, looks like we're right on schedule here, I'll switch gears into a few case studies uh, that I've been involved in in the last year. And I think they illustrate the attempt for best practice and implementing best practice. They also demonstrate some of the challenges in doing so. Uh, 
So for New England COD, I'll talk about you know, the challenges of revising management units. I'll move to COD in the North Sea to talk about the challenges of spatial data compilation. We'll stay in North Sea COD for shifting distributions. Atlantic halibut, Red Hake shifting distributions, and then wrap it up with some real tentative work on New England haddock on whether the boundaries themselves are static or whether they are um, time varying, even perhaps density dependent. So starting with New England cod, uh, we manage cod in the U.S. waters as two management units, the Gulf of Maine stock, the Jordan Bank stock. Neither one of those stocks is doing well. Uh, despite you know historically low catch limits for cod, um, we're not having really much rebuilding at all, and we're having retrospective patterns. In fact, the Jordan Bank cod assessment was rejected because of the retrospective patterns here. Um, we've had some warning flags raised about stock structure. In fact, uh, Ted Ames had started interviewing retired fishermen along uh, the coast of Maine about where they used to catch spawning cod and realize that cod don't spawn there anymore. That um, Ted and others are really concerned that um, historical fishing depleted distinct spawning groups of cod. And this may be leading to our, in a, our challenges in rebuilding cod. Um, but all, Ted's work also inspired about two decades of intensive research on cod stock identification. And that is uh, really in the process of culminating now with this Atlantic Cod Stock Structure Working Group. Um, it, it really reviewing all of the information in that table of context, contents from the genetics, our early life history, later life history, um, natural marks like uh, otoliths, uh, otolith microstructure, otolith chemistry, morphology, uh, tagging studies, and fishermen's ecological knowledge as well. And from synthesizing all of that, we found that there are five distinct populations in U.S. waters. Uh, so that the Georges Bank Management Unit really consists of three separate reproductively isolated populations. There is a population in the western Gulf of Maine and east of Cape Cod that straddles the current management unit boundary. And in the Gulf of Maine, we also have uh, multiple um, populations and some of them overlap. Um, we have these uh, winter spawners in the western Gulf of Maine and um, spring spawners in the Gulf of Maine. And because of their seasonal spawning differences, they're reproductively isolated and they're genetically distinct. So this really poses a challenge now for trying to assess and manage the, this complexity of cod populations. Fortunately, for a lot of the productive cod populations, we have a lot of data. Um, this is work that Micah Dean had done to distinguish the spring spawners from the winter spawners. So even though they have um, spatial overlap in the western Gulf of Maine, we've been collecting otoliths for years. So this is an example from the Massachusetts Trawl Survey, where um, Micah and others were able to distinguish between the winter spawners in blue and the spring spawners in green just by the size of their first annulus because of their different spawning seasons and their different growth history in the first year. So we can apply stock composition analysis to come up with uh, the catch that came from the spring spawners versus the winter spawners and survey indices for spring and winter spawners. So we think for these, for some of the productive cod populations, we have the data we need for um, better stock assessments that are aligned with those populations. However, it really adds a lot more complexity. Um, this complexity is going to have some challenges with it. Um, in the Gulf of Maine and on Eastern Georgia's bank, again, we've been sampling these for years. We have a lot of data. As I talked about in down East Maine, they've been depleted for years. We don't have a lot of fishery data there. We don't have a lot of survey catches there. So this is probably going to be a data limited stock assessment if it were to be a separate stock assessment. So the New England doesn't have much commercial catch. Our offshore trawl surveys don't catch much of it. So we might have to rely on inshore state trawl surveys as a recruitment index, uh, recreational catch, maybe even recreational catch rates for a more data moderate um, assessment. And so what we're going through now, uh, Lisa Kerr and I have just uh, received some funding from SINAR, the simulation test, the performance, 
of the current stock assessment units um, and these alternatives? And really, does the overall system perform better if we account for the population structure more accurately? And of course, this isn't just a science experiment. Uh, this has a lot of management implications. Um, our ground fish fisheries in New England have transitioned to catch shares in 2010. Those individual allocations um, were based on catch histories by the current management units. Each man management unit had different regulations. So it's really gonna layer on a lot of complexity. And so right now there's a management working group um, that's going through this, the data that would be required, the management changes that would be required. And the big question is to the advantages of accurate stock delineation and stock assessment outweigh the transition costs of the management. And so uh, we don't know the answer to this yet, but uh, we're really investing a lot into this management working group and to the simulation testing to see if it, um, what the advantages would be of changing the management units and the assessment units uh, for COD. So I'm gonna go across the North Atlantic now to the North Sea, where we have some similarities to what we saw in New England for COD. We've seen a de depletion of cod. It's assessed as a single unit in the North Sea, the Skagerrak Strait, and the eastern part of the English Channel. But we've seen a depletion. Uh, there were very low catch limits uh, that were managed for North Sea cod. There was temporary rebuilding, but now again, a downturn. Also, the retrospective patterns that we were seeing for some of the New England stocks. We saw some of the same warning flags that came up. Um, this uh, paper, published by Hutch, Hutchinson, uh, warned of the dangers of ignoring stock complexity by depleting some of the population components in the North Sea. So through ICES, um, we, a workshop was convened last summer to review all of the information available for North Sea cod, from genetics to tagging, um, early life history, and so on. From all of that, and this is a couple hundred page report, identified there are reproductively isolated populations on the Viking Bank in the Northeast and the Dogger Bank in the South Central North Sea. Both of these populations share the Skagerrak Strait as a nursery ground. And there's some phenotypic structure within the Dogger population in the Northwest where there's different growth and maturity rates than in the South. And so we had recommendations to account for this population structure in the benchmark stock assessment um, that's being done this year. When we look at the survey, a spatial analysis of the survey data, we had some common trends among areas from the 80s, 90s, early 2000s, but then a divergence where the, there was never any rebuilding in the South. Uh, that temporary rebuilding was in the Northern areas. So that's from the survey data. The survey can be spatially disaggregated um, to come up with these different indices. The fishery data is a little bit more of a challenge. And so uh, we have vessel monitoring system data. So this is an example from 2008, where we can look at the cod catch and the cod landing unit effort uh, by different areas. So there was a data call for each of the nations that are catching cod to report their data by these putative stock areas. Uh, so that was done last winter. Unfortunately, we weren't able to reproduce the aggregate catch from the disaggregated catch. And so this is going to need another iteration. Some quality controls needed here to reconcile these differences from the aggregate area catch reporting and the dis disaggregated area catch reporting. So we're going to have to go back and uh, try this again. In the meantime, we have some exploratory um, survey-based analyses that show different trends in spawning stock biomass in the north than in the south. Um, there were some interim uh, measures here. We have cod, older cod moving to the west of Scotland. Um, right now, there's a bit of magic wand being waved over this, essentially assuming that natural mortality increases at older ages to account for this immigration. Uh, but a lot of us are not entirely satisfied with this. And uh, we have another benchmark planned for next year um, where spatial assessments will be developed and reviewed. And so looking forward to this complexity, we really hope that integrated assessments will be the solution to some of these challenges with disaggregated data.
So you've seen most of these data uh, data inventory plots like this before uh, from stock synthesis and other programs. The difference here, and, and actually here we have spatially disaggregated surveys, just a cartoon example of a time series of a survey in the north, time series of survey in the south. We can't do the same with the fishery data. We can only go back to about 2008 with our spatially disaggregated catch data and our age composition data, and we're going to have to have an aggregated fleet in the historical years to capture the historical stock sizes, the depletion during the 80s and 90s. Now that's going to have to be done with an aggregate fleet, an aggregate age composition, and only in recent years will we be able to disaggregate that to the north and the south. So North Sea Cod also touches on the second question that we have in trying to implement best practices for stock structure, and that's the common occurrence of shifting spatial distributions. Um, and we've seen this in cod for a while. Back to the cod and climate days, it was first uh, seen uh, in the early 90s that the young fish were changing their distribution, where historically in the 70s and 80s, there were a lot in the Southern North Sea, uh, but in the 90s and early 2000s, really didn't see many H1 or H2 cod there. And so it really brought up some hypotheses about the causes of these spatial shifts. Is it so simple that individual cod are moving from unsuitable habitat in the south to more suitable habitat in the north? Uh, for other species, there may be demographic patterns where maybe this was a nursery area, an adult spawning area, um, range expansion from effective early life history dispersal, or the other main hypothesis that I'll be touching on are divergent trends from independent populations. And as you probably guessed from uh, the genetic results that I talked about, this latter hypothesis seems to be what's driving the spatial shift in cod. Uh, there's an oceanographic boundary around the Dogger Bank where we have seasonal stratification in the north. We have well-mixed area uh, throughout the year in the south. And in the south, there's been increasingly unfavorable habitat. In the north, there's been increasingly favorable habitat. So that could be consistent with cod moving across this boundary to the north. But all of our tagging, from our conventional tagging, electronic tagging, um, we see no evidence of cod leaving the south and going up to the north through this period. Um, and so it really does appear that we have these two distinct Viking and dogger populations that are behaving, responding differently to climate change. We have a similar situation with halibut. Um, halibut uh, in Canadian waters is Marine Stewardship um, Council certified. We've seen increasing trends in the Bay of Fundy and the Scotian Shelf, Gulf of St. Lawrence and on the Grand Banks. Down in U.S. waters, we really just see a depleted stock with not much sig signal of rebuilding, uh, such to the point where it's a species of concern in U.S. waters. So this really gives, when you look at the magnitude of Canadian catch to U.S. catch, you've got to wonder if the U.S. resource is really just a fringe of a more healthy Canadian resource, and if this is just uh, shifting distributions of individuals. So um, Nancy Shackle has uh, led over the last year uh, really an interdisciplinary review of halibut stock structure. Um, there's been some genetic differences uh, between U.S. Scotian Shelf and the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Uh, a lot of archival tag telemetry shows fidelity to distinct spawning grounds, and those spawning grounds are different among areas. So it does look at least part of this, um, differences in Marine Stewardship Council listing and red list listing um, has to do with population structure rather than simply movement of individuals into preferred habitat. Another example is red hake. Um, we manage red hake as two units uh, in the north and the south. Uh, the north has a fairly healthy uh, biomass index. These are data limited assessments. The south has a depleted survey index to the point where there's a rebuilding plan going on for Red Hake. But Red Hake is also one of the poster children for spatial uh, distribution shifts. Um, we can see that in the 60s and 70s, 
Um, most of the resource was south of Cape Cod, and that has shifted up into the Gulf of Maine. And so one of our terms of reference for the 2020 research track stock assessment was to um, study the stock structure of Red Hill. And what we've seen when we apply Jason Cope and Andre Punt's uh, method of clustering our survey trends, we find distinct clusters of patterns of abundance over time in the north that are different than the patterns in the south. That doesn't entirely um, test the hypothesis of the shift because um, individual fish could be moving up contributing to those um, similar patterns. But when we look at the size at age, and this is over a range of ages, uh, the size at age, we have exactly the same clustering. And so we have at least phenotypic stock structure. And if we had individual movement from the south to the north, it would really deteriorate this um, boundary pattern that we see. So it does appear that the shifts in distribution that we saw uh, for Red Hake are more similar to North Sea Cod, where it's divergent trends of two different uh, population components. So um, I think spatial shifts are a challenge for stock assessment and for stock identification, but we need to look at the hypotheses that, are, um, that might be causing these spatial shifts. Do we have simply individual fish moving northward? For some of our uh, fish on the East Coast, like sea bass and scup, that may be true, and uh, Rich Bell and others had um, looked at these hypotheses, as opposed to stocks like summer flounder, where it appears uh, more consistent with a demographic expansion. When summer flounder were rebuilt, the age structure was rebuilt, and the older summer flounder are moving further north. So there was a range shift because of demographic shift. And then John Hare and Ken Abel had posed a hypothesis for Atlantic croaker, in which they've always had dispersal from the South Atlantic Bight up into the Mid-Atlantic Bight. But with warming and other climate change, um, some of that those eggs and larvae are now able to survive in the North. So it's an early life history mechanism of the range expansion. And then, as I just showed, for North Sea Cod, for Red Hake, and for Atlantic Halibut, there may be divergent trends from independent populations. So I'm going to wrap it up um, with George's Bank Haddock uh, pretty quickly, and this one's still pretty fresh. We're still in the middle of this, but we have two U.S. management units similar to Cod with this Eastern Georgia's Bank transboundary area. Uh, the assessment of that Eastern Georgia's Bank Haddock um, was recently rejected because of these large retrospective patterns. There's some concern that there may be haddock that are emigrating to the west, uh, causing uh, this model misspecification. When we look at um, everything available for haddock, it appears as though it's really been a change over time, is that when the Eastern Georgia's Bank Management Unit was delineated, there were fairly discrete distributions of haddock on Eastern Georgia's Bank and in what we call the Great South Channel. Um, but that was at a time when the stock was severely depleted. So if we look forward to our current distributions, we now see much more continuous distribution across the bank. And so it appears as though during times of abundance, Haddock will move into the Great South Channel from multiple areas. Um, and when the abundance is low, that it will constrict into just prime habitat. Uh, that's very consistent with the genetics that we have. A recent study um, shows that we have an isolation by distance pattern um, and haddock on Georgia's bank appear to be a mix of several distinct populations. The mechanism of mixture are these episodic recruitment events. Uh, throughout its range from Europe to New England, haddock have these characteristic rare large recruitment events and it appears that these are the mechanisms um, of mixture in range expansion and perhaps even changing boundaries uh, between adjacent units depending on their recent recruitment. So since we don't have definitive stock identification, or at least a definitive stock boundary between the Gulf of Maine and Georgia's Bank, it somewhat depends on the relative abundance of those two stocks. Um, we're really going pluralistic um, with our explorations in the Haddock Research Track Assessment. We're 
trying out different spatial delineations from Eastern Georgia's Bank, Eastern and Western Georgia's Bank, including the Great South Channel and including Southern New England. Um, since we don't have definitive biological data, we really want to see which of these spatial um, combinations of areas perform the best in which we have the best cohort tracking, the best model diagnostics. And we may have to base our decisions um, on that rather than on the stock identification information that we have. So I'll wrap it up is that we can define boundaries um, for our fishery stocks. Uh, we often hear that we don't have the information to do this. And I don't accept that because a lot of our routine fishery data that we collect, the catch by area, uh, the fishing effort by area, the catch by effort by area, the size and maturity at age. So I, I showed an example with red hay, where those really helped us to um, determine different areas with at least phenotypic stocks. Um, we have traditional approaches from parasites to tagging. Hopefully we can apply some more advanced approaches, genetics, auto with chemistry, stitch those all together for an interdisciplinary conclusion. Going forward, uh, we're hopeful that spatial assessment and fishery management are possible. There are valid practical challenges that I hope I showed with those recent examples for defining boundaries and spatial assessments. Uh, we really think that integrated assessments offer solutions to some of these challenges. Uh, for example, the data matrix with North Sea Cod. We're hoping that we can take advantage of the recent spatial complexity of data without losing the long-term aggregate data that we had. And then finally, simulation testing can help us to evaluate whether these more complex assessment models are worth developing and if they perform better for meeting our management objectives. So I'll wrap it up here with some recommendations. Um, best practice for defining stock boundaries. Um, synthesize all the information available to us to come up with the most plausible population structure. Ideally, align your stock boundaries with those that perception of population structure. And then if you have some overlap, like we do in the Gulf of Maine cod, we may need to estimate stock composition for mixed stock fisheries. So this number three is optional for some. If we have spatial strata, we need to compile the data by these spatial strata, as I showed with North Sea cod. Using that, we're going to need that information to develop exploratory spatial assessments. And these may be developmental, uh, they may be complex, they may be uncertain, but we can use those to condition spatial operating models and use those operating models to test the performance of simple to complex estimation models. And hopefully, by iterating through this, we can advance towards the optimal geographic scope and the optimal spatial structure for meeting our assessment needs and our management needs for each victory. So I will end it there, but if that leaves you wanting more, uh, there's lots more coming. Um, at the World Fisheries Congress, uh, Dan Gaithel, Aaron Berger, and Kristen Amori are organizing a session on spatial stock assessment methods. So their contact information is there. Uh, contact them if you're interested. Um, there was supposed to be a national stock assessment workshop on spatial modeling that's been postponed, but talking to Kristen, uh, the planning for that uh, has been postponed a bit, but they may be picking up that issue, so stay tuned to that. And then finally, CAPM will be having their crescendo workshop in 2022, uh, potentially in Rome, and that will be um, presenting good practices in stock assessment modeling, including spatial modeling. So with that, um, I'll thank you for your attention and uh, answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Steve. That was a fabulous presentation. Um, audience, we have about 15 minutes to answer your questions, so please type them in the questions chat box and I'll read them to Steve. But before I start addressing the questions, I, I do want to encourage you to download today's slides from the handouts menu, which is in the control panel. If you're a NOAA contractor or employee, I also encourage you to access the articles that Steve cited in his presentation from the from this NOAA Central Library, because there's many of them and we have them. So let me get started with the question, Steve. Um, this first question came in early in your presentation and it asks, is the closed system for most stock assessments a holdover from freshwater systems where systems are indeed generally closed? 
That's a great question. Um, I hadn't thought of it that way. It usually goes back to Russell's 1931 definition of overfishing and sustainable yield, where he just um, really depicted closed stock dynamics. We have additions due to recruitment, we have losses due to natural mortality in fishing, and we have growth of individuals. He didn't account or immigration or emigration in those difference equations. And I think it was Daniel Pauly who first um, identified that that was the, the first, at least from, from Daniel's perspective, the first um, depiction of the closed unit stock assumption. Um, so I don't know that it came from inland fisheries um, where there are more discrete boundaries, um, but that's the earliest that I'd seen it uh, attributed to. I'd be open to anyone else who might know the answer. I'll let you know if we get the response. Um, this next question um, is says, regarding stock structure for North Sea cod, do they split coastal stocks in Norway from the main components you identified? Yeah, so that's, I didn't get into a lot of the details there, but um, genetics have shown that some of the boundaries in North Sea cod um, are valid population boundaries. Uh, it sounds like the questioner knows that there are fjord stocks um, off Norway that are different than the offshore migratory stocks that migrate up into the Barents Sea. Um, and so the fjord stocks, both in the Kattegat, um, in the Skagerrak, and the uh, west coast of Norway are separate from the North Sea. Those catches and those survey data don't go into the North Sea assessment. Great, thank you. Uh, this next question asks, does Walter's comment suggest that most stock assessments have been failures? Well, um, I don't want to speak for him, uh, but it was uh, Lobo Orensens who um, had quoted our Carl Walters for that. And um, Carl was involved in several of the um, Gulf of Alaska fisheries where they saw um, sequential depletion. And so um, he was seeing how that was a failure for some. And um, potentially, again, it may go back to fresh water and knowing the different runs of salmon that led to success of really identifying different salmon and doing that correctly. Um, I'll, I won't talk for Carl, but I, I think he would say that uh, a lot of the failures are due to ignoring stock structure. Are all of the successes accidents? I think that's probably an exaggeration. Uh, but I think he has a point there is that um, we often pat ourselves in the back uh, for a strong recruitment because it was a great assessment and great management when uh, it really may have been more fortuitous. Thank you. Um, next question. Are stock assessors still using non-spatial methods? Well, um, yes, in at least a broad sense, all of our assessments are spatial because they have a spatial delineation. But almost all of the assessments used for fishery management to inform fishery management are not spatial within that model. Uh, they assume a dynamic pool uh, within the stock assessment. There are some except exceptions. Um, a red snapper in the Gulf of Mexico I mentioned is actually spatially structured. They don't allow movement between areas in that Gulf of Mexico red snapper assessment. Uh, but as um, Aaron Berger and his co-authors had uh, concluded in their review of spatial assessments, they're rarely applied to management. Most of our assessments that are applied to management are non-spatial. Very good. Uh, next question asks, how important is understanding spatially referenced effort to looking at fishing mortality, for example, using AIS and fleet spatial dynamics? Yeah, there's a lot of promise there for high resolution data. And I showed it a bit with North Sea Cod, where we have all of these vessel monitoring system data. It can be difficult to attribute the catch for each of those effort events. Um, that takes a bit of work because we often have aggregate uh, trip-based catch statistics with tow-based or effort-based um, effort statistics. Um, and so there's a bit of work that needs to be done there, but there's a great promise for doing that um, and using that type of high resolution data uh, to get the spatially disaggregated data we need. Beyond that, if we're using the fishery catch rates as an index of abundance, 
then um, spatiotemporal modeling like uh, Jim Thorson's VAST are really promising for using that effort data uh, in the fine scale collection of that effort data to better standardize for the more precise location of the fishing effort in the fishing gap. Excellent. Uh, next question asks, is stock assessment moving towards an agent-based modeling approach rather than spatial strata with homogeneous characteristics? Yeah, that's a, a great question. I don't think so far, in the, you know, who knows the near, the, the far future, uh, but of course in early life history models, uh, agent-based have been really helpful. Um, when it comes to some of the themes of stock identification that I talked about are early life history dispersal, uh, agent-based models have been very helpful. I mean, you could view our dynamic pool models as agent-based as well, uh, but they're more of a large dynamic pool assuming homogeneity rather than the agent-based models, which really gets into the individual variation. So when it comes to either adult movement modeling, agent-based models have been very um, informative. Early life history dispersal models, they've been informative. I haven't, see, well, I haven't seen them used uh, operationally for fishery management for the entire life history. Um, and so going from the early life history stages throughout the later life histories and the population closure, uh, that would be very difficult in an agent-based model. So I don't think in the near future, um, but maybe in the further future, uh, they may have some promise. Thank you. Um, a couple more questions here. Uh, this is more of a comment, but um, something I think the reader would like you to comment on. It's interesting to see MSY lines on graphs as though they are somehow real. The fluctuation and downward trend in catches says otherwise. Yeah, um, I think a lot of those that were shown were um, long-term MSY um, calculations and they may have a long-term stationarity assumption in them, either a stock recruit or, or a, a production function in them. Um, but you know, the, the trend toward dynamic uh, reference points, dynamic V0, dynamic um, MSY reference points might be appropriate for some of these you know, stocks that are impacted by climate. In fact, stock structure, which we've been talking about, if, we've, if there were historically more spawning components that are now depleted, are we comparing apples to oranges? Um, is it impossible to rebuild uh, resources that used to have more spawning components than they currently have? Uh, I think it's a great comment. Uh, I'm not gonna defend uh, static um, MSY reference points, uh, but they are still commonly being used. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, this is another similar comment. And uh, again, it says spatial shifts imply standard survey methods will have to be changed from st uh, strata based to larger geographic coverage. More effort will be needed. Yeah, so this, um, I think here's one of the the advantages of a multi species model. Um, and in the region I work in, in the Northeast US, you know, the, the offshore survey. Um, goes everywhere from Cape Hatteras up to the Scotian shelf. So it wasn't designed for any single species. Uh, if it were designed for a single species, then you'd be absolutely right. Then we'd have to re-stratify and extend the strata set to the um, shifting distribution. But with a multi-species model, we're pretty much already sampling those areas where maybe historically this, the target species wasn't, or it was a low density, and now it's at higher density. Um, and I think there are advantages to shelf-wide surveys, broad-scale surveys for multi-species. They're more robust to these spatial shifts than um, targeted single-species surveys. Excellent. Uh, next question asks, do you find that it's more efficient to conduct stock ID efforts on multiple species at the same time, or is it better to just focus on individual species? Yeah, so I'll, um, nested within that, I'll make a, a pitch for investigating stock identification within the entire range of a single species. Often, as the Georges Bank haddock, we're really just focused on Georges Bank. Uh, 
But I think it was instructive to look at Haddock across the North Atlantic and the characteristic patterns that it had. And many of those characteristic patterns for Haddock appear to apply to Jordan Bank. Characteristic patterns for cod apply to both New England and North Sea. But getting to your question, um, John Hare has been a, a real advocate of this. So John Hare is now uh, the Northeast Center Director, uh, but he also wrote one of the chapters of the Stock Identification Methods uh, book, the Early Life History um, chapter. And John is an advocate of you know some of the oceanographic processes that are determining the dispersal of yellowtail founder may also be applicable to scallops. Um, and so not even within functional ecological groups across broad taxonomic groups, uh, there can be some advantages to looking at um, multiple species in some of these processes. However, uh, because of the species concept and reproductive isolation, we do need to consider them species specific as well. So although there can be some overarching uh, advantages to uh, considering multiple species, when you're sampling genetics, when you're doing oceanographic dispersal modeling, um, fishery monitoring, um, all of those can benefit from multiple species approaches. We do need to consider them as reproductively isolated units as well. Wonderful. I think this is probably going to be our last question. Um, this question asks, how useful is eDNA going to be to quickly ID stocks, even on commercial vessels? Yeah, it seems to have promise. And, you know, even the last few years, um, it, we initially thought it could just be presence absence, but it could also have an index of density. Um, we need to know um, the proximity of the live individual to the piece of DNA that was detected in the water or whatever sample it was from. Um, so there are some assumptions in the eDNA, but it seems to have a lot of potential. I lied, there's another question. <laughs> um, is there a relationship between data richness and the value of stock ID efforts? I.e., is there a point where a species is just too data poor for stock ID to be worthwhile? Yeah, um, you know, the, we've also had a few data for examples, um, but I'll stick with my first point is that if we have data for data limited stock assessment, we have at least some of the fundamental data to start looking at for fishing patterns, um, you know, size structure, age structure. There are two schools of thought on a precautionary approach to data data poor or data limited stock structure? Do we keep all the pieces where, you know, we really need to, uh, the, the precautionary approach would be to manage each potentially different stock separately, uh, but that can be misleading as well. And so there are really two schools of thought on that, what's the best approach to do. Um, and so similar to stock assessment, where the best thing to do is to incentivize data collection for assessment, whether that's fishery monitoring or compositional sampling, uh, index development, uh, the same thing needs to be done for stock identification. When we have these situations, we really need to try to incentivize and fund um, some data collection for stock identification. Okay, and this really is the last question. <laughs> it's a genuine lots of interest, it's great. Phenotypic differences in species can be assumed to be due to either a population structure or due to environmental factors. These differing assumptions would have a large impact on model structure. Have there been any simulation studies where this assumption has been chosen incorrectly, i.e. due to a lack of genetic data or lack of conclusive genetic difference? Yeah, so um, phenotypic structure tells us a few things. It tells us that we don't have a well-mixed stock because if we did, we wouldn't be able to detect uh, differences, phenotypic differences. Um, it also tells us that there are different vital rates between these areas. So when it comes to um, post-larval population modeling, modeling phenoty phenotypic stocks separately um, is consistent with the model assumptions. Where you'd need to be careful is your stock recruit assumptions, which closes the life history um, circuit because different phenotypic stocks may be contributing to each other with recruitment. It's really the post-recruitment modeling that is best within a phenotypic stock 
it's that um, population renewal and stock recruitment where you'd have to be careful about assuming um, a closed stock recruitment function within a phenotypic stock that's probably not justified by the phenotypic differences although separate post recruitment modeling of phenotypic stocks is justified by Excellent. Well, that will have to be the last question because we've hit the hour. And I thank you so much and, and to the audience for your wonderful questions as well. I just want to add that for any of you who um, might, might want to reach out privately to Steve, I've added his uh, email to the chat. So it's in there. And there's also a link to the YouTube channel. So I encourage you to share the recording of this webinar with interested colleagues. So I will upload it to the NOAA Central Library YouTube channel in a couple of hours after we end this presentation. Any last comments, Steve or, or Kristen? No, well, I'll just thank everybody for your time and attention and the opportunity to present here. I'll look forward to the next seminars. We will look forward to having you back as an audience member. Um, wonderful. Well, thank you, Steve, for your presentation and, and to Kristen for organizing the National Stock Assessment Science Seminar Series. And audience, I'm glad you joined us for today's library seminar. NOAA Central Library is very proud to present the work of the NOAA community and its partners, and we hope you'll join us again. So be well all. Take care.